I wanted to start off by touching on some of the things the Auditor General mentioned uh, around the financial statement audits for last year. What worked, what didn't work, what are some of the challenges, and then go into the accounting standard updates that are going to impact over the next couple of years. In terms of timeliness, for something like 332 of the 348 state agencies that we audit each year, 76.9% were found to meet their legislative timeframes, which is an improvement on the previous year and it's probably not a bad effort considering the machinery of government changes. So uh, given the changes that came about with the election last year, that was probably the biggest impact on why agencies didn't meet their timeframes. On the other hand, you also need to keep in mind that those uh, machinery of government changes also provided extensions of time for getting your financial statements done. So the challenge is this year is getting back to our, our standard deadlines, back to 31 August for this year. Local government, 67%, I believe, around that got their statements done by 30 November. However, if you look at who got their statements done by 31 October, which is the new deadline for local governments, it was only around 12%. So local governments uh, probably have a challenge this year in getting their statements done by the new timeframes. We also looked at quality in terms of two aspects, and we looked at 42 of the most significant public sector entities, which included a combination of departments, staff bodies, and GOCs. We measured them against better, a better practice guide, and we found that 88% came, ac came across as satisfactory in terms of our better practice guide. 12% were identified as needing some improvement. The other area you'll notice that we report on is the no amount of adjustments that were required. So we found that for state entities, there was a total of $793 million required to adjust in the financial statements. Now that can include both management and audit identified adjustments, but we're looking at any adjustments that were made from the time audit got a set of financial statements uh, to the time the financial statements were actually signed off. Our appendix C to the report identifies the framework that we assess the statements against. So obviously key aspects we're looking at, was there a financial report preparation plan? Uh, preparation of shell financial statements, I think if you want to get your statements at a high quality and in a timely manner, get your shell statements done early and available to the audit. Doing the monthly financial reporting well. The Auditor General mentioned that this morning and, and I believe that the Under Treasurer has written to agencies in re that regard. Making sure that there's appropriate quality control procedures in place. The standard of supporting documentation is always important. And competency of staff, and I think that's a, obviously a challenge with machinery of government changes. The staff that maybe have been used in the past may no longer be, be there. The access to staff may be an issue. And again, I think that's an area where actually bringing forward processes can actually assist when you don't have the same level of staff available, the competent staff that you had previously. What are the common issues that related to delays or the quality of financial statements? I don't think there's any surprises there. Asset valuations continues to be the biggest issue. It's probably the most complex area that we have, uh, particularly if you've got large infrastructure assets that don't have market values, you've got to go out, get independent valuations using depreciated replacement cost. So it's about getting that timing of your valuation process worked out early. And that also includes allowing for review and assessment of the values by management. Uh, and I think part of that is making sure that management take ownership of the process, even where you get independent valuers in to give you your values. Ultimately, they are your values to be in your financial statements. You need to know what those values represent. You need to understand the assumptions used by the valuers and you need to challenge the valuers. Disclosure of key information, we'll touch on shortly AASB 13 and the changes it's going to have. But even under the existing standards, you need to have adequate disclosure of your valuations, processes, what are the key inputs and assumptions used, and probably most importantly, what are the significant movements? Why, why might a valuation materially move from one year to the next, what does it represent? They probably need to be disclosed, the reasons why that movement occurs. One of the areas we've identified as a bit of an issue, um, impact of 
natural disasters, even going back two years, we obviously had more this year, which may impact, and recording of impairment of infrastructure assets. Something to keep in mind, under the impairment standard, AASB 136, it talks about if you are a not-for-profit entity and your assets don't generate cash, you basically work out recoverable amount using value in use, which they say use depreciated replacement cost. So if you're using depreciated replacement cost also to estimate fair value, you should not have an impairment because you're using depreciated replacement cost both as your fair value and as your value in use. A couple of the other areas we looked at in terms of financial statement quality, equity adjustments, and we're talking about adequate disclosure of what equity adjustments represent. Dropping, having equity withdrawals so that contributed equity is hitting a negative number. The concept of contributed equity is it's what the owners put into the entity. You can't take out any more than you actually put in. So if they're taking something else out, it's no longer contributed equity. They're taking away retained earnings or something else. Use of reserves, it's an area we focused on the last 12 months, certainly, and we'll be continuing to focus. Can you justify the reserves you have? A lot of the reserves we've seen in the past now being reduced and written off, which is a good thing. It's not really a modern style concept. It's really a bit of a management accounting concept, so be wary of that. We will be continuing to look at that. Making sure your policy note disclosures are up to date and accurate. And also compliance with FRR disclosure requirements. Again, some of them may not seem significant at the time, but they are a specific requirement. If you're a department or a stat body, you need to comply with those. They're backed by the financial performance management standard. So make sure you go through those. A key thing, if you've looked at the draft FRRs for this year that Treasury have released and asked for comment on, it's made it very clear now that the FRRs are in addition to your accounting standard disclosure requirements. They've actually taken out the, the duplication between the accounting standard requirements and the FRRs. So they really are a standalone a document now. So you need to consider what the FRRs require and you also need to understand the accounting standard. So they need to be considered separately. So what can we do for 2012-13? So look at your early closes and even if you don't do any hard closes, what can you get done early? Things like your asset valuation process we touched on. Any major provisions, calculations, actuarial assessments that you need done, get them done early and out the road. Preparation of shell financial statements and make sure they're reviewed by audit. Give them to your auditors. As the Auditor General said, this is about working together. It's not just you need to do this. Make sure the auditors are working with you to, to smooth out the process. Get clearance on complex accounting issues. Don't leave it till after 30 June. Get them all done, out the road, documented, approved by the appropriate people. Get your regular reporting processes up to date and an appropriate quality. Have a look at what you did last year. Did it work well? What worked well? What didn't? What do we need to change for this year? Ensure availability of key staff. When are they going to be available? Do you need to seek extra resources or if that's not practical, how do you overcome that? Is it by bringing forward these strategies? And have appropriate QA processes in place. And we're talking about if you've got audit committee oversight, make sure that they're involved early looking at the shell accounts. What changes do they want to see? And not just giving them a final set of accounts when audit's there to give clearance. Get them involved early as well. So what have we got in line for this year in terms of the accounting standards? In terms of this year, there's some presentation changes to your statement of comprehensive income. The other change is around classification of other comprehensive income. Again, it's a presentation requirement. You now need to break up other comprehensive income between those items which will not be reclassified in future years and those that will. So an item that won't be reclassified through profit or loss is your asset revaluation surplus. So when you revalue something and the increment goes through your revaluation surplus account, the only way it gets out of that is if you dispose of the asset and it goes through retained earnings. However, there are some specific items and they're identified in the standards which will need to be reclassified subsequently through profit or loss. One of the areas is 
uh, financial assets uh, that are available for sale. So you remeasure those. Initially, that will go through as other comprehensive income, and then when you dispose of them later, some of that may need to go back through your profit or loss. So you need to be aware of that. Now, if you're doing 30 June accounts, you've got another 12 months before this one, these standards kick in, but if you've got a 31 December year end, you're in the middle of this process now, 